550 million years for two eyes. This 520 million years for a backbone. 470 million years for three semicircular canals, extremely ancient structures. 470 million years for jaws. 370 million years for four limbs, but get this, 300 million years for five digits. It took 70 million years to settle down to the number five, which is basic for mammals. The first vertebrates with digits had seven and eight as paddle-like structures, and they only settled down to five very late. It took 70 million years to, for that to settle down. Three ear ossicles, which mammals have, 130 million years made up of parts of the jaw bones. Same dental formula, 35 million years. And external testes, 90 million years. So you can see that the human body has been built up of different bits over a long period of geological time. We're not one integrated organism made all at once. Some parts are ancient and we share with other creatures. Some parts are more recent and we share them with a different set of creatures and so on until we find unique human things. Okay, so if you stopped me in the cafeteria at lunchtime and said, what's the story of human evolution? This is what I draw on a napkin. So you can see at the bottom, I've put some time there, six million years about to today, and one million year time slices. And there's a thing called LCA at the bottom, that's the last common ancestor between chimps and humans. So we split from chimps somewhere around about six million years ago. And those first bipedal apes were bipedal on the human lineage. They were bipedal, and we don't know too much about them. We, they, we know that their teeth had fairly thin enamel, like chimpanzees do, and that gradually, over the course of, of uh, four million years, they, these bipedal apes got bigger teeth and thicker enamel teeth. The other lineage that, that split at the time, they went the opposite way, and they developed small teeth, and instead of, small, instead of big teeth, they had tooth substitutes. They had stone tools. So the first stone tools occur at about two and a half million years ago. And at the same time, commensurate with that, there's a brain size increase. So we start getting smaller teeth, and the teeth are replaced in their function by tools, as Darwin predicted. And at that time, about two million years ago, something happened that enabled these first small-toothed, big-brained, bigger-brained apes to get out of Africa for the first time. So they get out of Africa and they turn up in Eurasia. That's the first out of Africa. Uh, that lineage continues, and there's a second out of Africa around 100,000 years to 200,000 years ago with a second brain size increase and the origin of modern human cultures and symbolism. And out of that second out of Africa, together with the people that led to that second out of Africa, all of us have come. So all of us are Africans. Until very recently, uh, we were all Africans. That guy knows there's a banana there. This guy doesn't. He understands that another chimp has different thoughts and can act strategically to take advantage of that. That's totally wild. This completely blue sort of developmental theory of mind, human people, out of the water. So we're not so unique with that. Where are we unique, though, in the capacity to do what's called secondary theory of mind, to understand that that individual doesn't know that that individual knows that that individual understands something about that individual. And what you wind up getting is, this is why we could make it through a performance of Midsummer's Night Dream and Chimps Can't in terms of trying to keep straight of, wait, who knows what about who and what happened when, and chimps would not put up with this because they can't do secondary theory of mind. So again, initially we're seeming not quite so unique, and then we're taking a basic primate attribute and putting into very novel realm. Then the sequence comes out, and yes, indeed, there is that much overlap. So of course the question then becomes, where's the differences? What are the genetics of what distinguishes us from chimps? So people have studied this. Right off the bat, about half the differences in gene expression have to do with genes coding for olfactory receptors. Chimps have a better sense of smell than we do. All sorts of genes they have for olfactory receptors, we've inactivated into what are called pseudogenes. 
What that tells us is if, like, you wipe out half of a chimp's sense of smell genetically, you're halfway there to making a human. Okay. This is not very impressive. Okay, so what other genes have been identified? Some having to do with like the size of the pelvic arch. We walk upright, they don't as often. Some of it turns out to have to do with body hair. They're covered with fur and you know, it's only some humans that have like, you know, the guys with hair on their shoulders that are all unsettling. And you know, there's a genetics, there's some genetics about immune recognition you know, we keel over with certain diseases that chimps don't. We can survive tuberculosis for years. Chimps don't. They can handle simian AIDS in ways that we can't the human version. So it's differences immune function, some aspects of reproductive isolation, so you're unlikely to get chimp-human hybrids. All, that accounts for almost all the genetic differences. Where are the genes that are relevant to the brain? And it turns out there's hardly any. And the few that have been identified make perfect sense because these are not genes that make it possible for us to have metaphor or genes that, because going back to that first slide, we've got the same nervous system basically that chimps do. There's only one difference, which is we've got like three times as many neurons. And what the genetic differences are, are genes having to do with the number of rounds of cell division during fetal brain development. Essentially what that says is take a chimp brain fetally and let it go two or three more rounds of division and you get a human brain instead and out come symphonies and ideology and hopscotch and everything else there. What that tells you is with enough quantity you invent quality. It's just sheer numbers and out of that emerges in this non-linear, non-reductive way all the stuff that makes us human. What those genes are about is producing a brain, a human brain, of a certain sort of level of qualities, but it has nothing to do with what particular qualities there are. You're with your partner in private, in your bedroom, hugging, kissing, petting, licking, having vaginal intercourse, the usual, total conventional scene. Your cat still thinks that you're a goddamn freak. <laughs> and she's right. She's revolted by the fact that you mate during the female's non-fertile time. That's just disgusting. <laughs> and she thinks that you're a moron for sticking with one sexual partner given a single ovulatory cycle. This makes no sense at all. And this privacy thing, that's just weird. Everyone knows you have to, you're supposed to have sex in public where the social group can watch and join in if necessary. <laughs> and finally, if a baby results from this lovemaking, she'll wonder what the male is doing, hanging around all the time, helping out, providing resources, the wimp. <laughs> and don't get your cat started on that child. Five years old and it still can't take care of itself? What a loser. <laughs> so as your cat knows, humans are off on the fringe here. And most other mammals, the female advertises her fertility with clear signals, unique sexual gestures, and calls, odors, and swellings, and so on. Males and females do not typically approach each other for sex outside of these fertile times. By contrast, human feels, females have concealed ovulation. There are no clear displays of a woman's ovulatory cycle. And one consequence of this is that most human sex, even most human penis-vagina intercourse, is recreational. It's not time to the ovulatory phase. Even it, it even continues in situations where conception is completely impossible, such as during pregnancy or after menopause. Another way in which humans are aberrant has to do with our choice of sex partners. Over 90% of mammalian species are highly sexually promiscuous. So both males and females have multiple sexual partners on the same day. Humans tend to be monogamous, or at least serially monogamous. And what's crucial here when we speak about the relative monogamy of humans is that most women have a single sexual partner in a given ovulatory cycle. And how do we get clever us from these lousy parts? And I think you know the answer. And the answer is in order to do that, uh, you've got to have an extremely large number of these lousy parts of these neurons. So in the human brain, uh, we're talking on the order of 200 uh, billion neurons. And you have to have them massively interconnected. So each neuron, on average, is receiving between 5 and 10,000 contacts 
from other neurons in the brain. And so when you do the math, you're you know, kind of all on the order of 500 trillion to a quadrillion synaptic connections. All right, well, that is a big, fat head. There's a, a couple of really big problems that come up here, right? So in order to build a clever brain, you can only add stuff on. You, cannot, you can't take stuff away. So like, imagine someone said to you, all right, I've got a great job for you. Uh, you're going to build the world's greatest speedboat. And you go, oh, great, I'd love that job. Sign up. Well, OK, actually, we didn't tell you. Uh, we're going to give you a dinghy. And the way you build the world's greatest speedboat is you can only add things to your dinghy, but you can't take anything away. And that's basically what's happened in, uh, in brain evolution. You've just glommed stuff on. So the fact that evolution of the brain proceeds mostly through agglomeration, and the fact that these neurons are lousy processors, we need, that we need a huge, fat, 1,200 cc adult size human brain to be clever. And so there's one problem with this, right? So uh, we got these big fat brains and these narrow vaginas, <laughs> right? And uh, so, so you women in the audience who've given birth know that this is a little problematic. And it, it turns out that Death in childbirth is almost exclusively a human phenomenon. You don't find it uh, in almost any other mammal, with the exception of the hyena. Uh, the hyena female has a pseudo phallus that it gives birth through, which is kind of a weird case. But leaving the hyena aside, death in childbirth is, 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 is uh, exclusively a human phenomenon. And the size, the volume of the brain at birth of a human infant is about 400 cubic centimeters. And that's really pushing the limit. That's about as, there, there's problems even there, right? You got this 400 cc brain. It's got to become a 1200 cc adult brain. And here's an issue. So you've got all these neurons. They've got all this crazy wiring that you need to build clever us with these shitty parts. And it turns out that that wiring, of course, isn't random, right? There is a wiring diagram for the brain. So then, like, when you get into all these trillions and quadrillions of connections, how do you specify that wiring diagram? Is there even enough information in the DNA and the genome to specify that wiring diagram? And the answer is, that it turns out that the wiring diagram of the brain is only roughly specified genetically. And at the very finest level, it turns out to be guided by experience. And that experience actually starts in utero. And uh, it proceeds in early life. And it proceeds at a very fast pace, furious pace, until about age five. And it uh, proceeds at a uh, much slower pace, but isn't done until about age 20. So uh, the consequence of these constraints is that we humans have absurdly, crazily long childhoods. So why then did humans end up with our grossly atypical mating system? Why did we end up with love? And the most compelling theory is that the human mating system has been driven by the fact that humans have the longest, most helpless childhood of any mammal. So while an orangutan or a gray whale mother can raise her offspring successfully without paternal involvement, human single mothers in traditional societies are a great disadvantage because their offspring remain helpless for so very long, as your cat knows. Human children with their slowly maturing brains are the reason for our atypical mating system with concealed ovulation, mostly recreational sex, reliable paternity, monogamy within an ovarian cycle, and paternal contribution to child rearing. Or to put it another way, if human neurons weren't such lousy processors and if brain evolution allowed for redesign, from the ground up, rather than proceeding mostly by agglomeration, then we wouldn't need such big fat brains and such long childhoods 